uh, you guys taking time out and uh, attending this uh, webinar so the way we will uh, progress is basically um, uh, we will uh, introduce you to the world of acad girl like how do we uh, kind of deliver or what's our mechanism and how do we kind of uh, enable uh, learning in a very very concise and a, a speedy manner okay i'll talk about myself i'll introduce myself of course and then uh, we will talk about like what is this uh, world of spark and uh, uh, definitely we'll uh, touch upon a lot of things the basic concepts and at the end we'll uh, uh, have a small demo which kind of uh, showcases uh, spark at its uh, uh, like where we'll show like how uh, th this is uh, the next level of uh, big data uh, workload processing engine uh, okay and meanwhile uh, feel free to have your questions and uh, we will we'll surely uh, kind of uh, uh, address them okay all right thanks and uh, also uh, before i start i would uh, definitely uh, if you guys could help me with your uh, background like if anybody has big data analytics or, or typically what kind of background you are from so that i can uh, pace my session accordingly and kind of uh, tailor it okay so while you do that uh, let's uh, let's get started okay so I'm going to open my presentation that I have. <clears throat> yeah, so let's uh, start with an introduction to Acid Grill, what we are about, and then uh, let's watch this is uh, a very uh, quick and uh, short video and um, I'm sure uh, you guys would uh, definitely like it. Doing is the only way you learn. Here at ACAT Guild, we focus on action. Learning step by step by working on real projects. At a CAD Guild, you step in as a novice, but in just 6 to 12 weeks, you come out as an expert. In today's skill-based job market, how many times have only certificates got you the job? Focus is always on skills, skills and more skills. Get to learn by developing two real applications. Choose from a wide variety of courses. Get videos. Learn live from expert mentors. The course ends with time of hands-on experience and a great career. Join us and learn in-demand skills like Android, Node.js, Big Data Cloud Computing, Digital Marketing, Analytics, and many more courses. The CAD Guild provides constant support to its students. Our teachers and subject experts guide you anytime you are stuck. Having the felicity to learn online at any time, anywhere at your convenience from the stalwarts of the industry is the icing on the cake. A CAD Guild knows the power of focus and quality, hence it has very small batch which gives more attention to the students and provides opportunities for doubt clearing sessions. Moreover, we make industry ready by offering you a bonus week of job preparation, which includes resume building, mock interviews, and presenting your resume to major companies. All right. Uh... So, uh, this will give you uh, uh, some sense about like, what uh, Acad Grill is all about and, uh, and <clears throat> how we kind of enable uh, learning in all these emerging and uh, disruptive areas. Okay. So, uh, th this was about. Uh, uh, <clears throat> And you can also uh, visit our uh, website. Uh, so there's a nice uh, portal that you have where you can get all the information and uh, obviously you can uh, easily navigate. And there is a blog also where we post the 
<laughs> latest happenings in the world of tech and uh, you'll find some uh, u- useful definitely a uh, lot of useful uh, stuff here as well okay so as you can see you have this uh, scala tutorial and uh, a lot of other things which we keep on uh, posting uh, so we are typically our mentors uh, they kind of uh, contribute to these uh, blogs these are the same people uh, who will be kind of uh, taking the class okay so let me close uh, all right so uh, so guys thanks for uh, uh, kind of um, uh, introducing yourselves uh, yes so yeah the ppt and uh, the video i'm i'm sure uh, it will be shared so we have um, quite a nice mix of participants uh, here today so we have uh, sudhakar who is working on as a java architect on the big data project so that's very nice uh, we we have uh, harsha who who is working as a hadoop team lead uh, at mercedes benz as eight years in experience in uh, it with five years so that that's uh, kind of you already have the background so that's really good whereas at the other end uh, we have uh, sam uh, who's uh, doing uh, mtech at amrita school of engineering uh, so the, the, this is quite an eclectic mix and uh, so i i'm sure we are uh, set up for an interesting evening ahead so <laughs> with that uh, basic introduction and the kind of uh, audience that we have let's uh, kind of get started with uh, what we have so that i have had your introduction uh, let me also introduce uh, myself okay so my name is uh, sandy and um, i have uh, 15 uh, years of experience in uh, it services product development consulting in the area of uh, and my core area is uh, big data data science machine learning and now uh, internet of things uh, solutioning and machine uh, architecture okay so i have been uh, working on the spark uh, platform or the spark ecosystem for the last uh, two and a half years i have started with the uh, version uh, whatever it was uh, 0.6 or even before that actually and uh, now we have moved on to spark 1.6 and uh, <clears throat> spark 2.0 is next actually uh, this summer so i worked in uh, um, a lot of the big big data technology areas uh, including hadoop and uh, and also uh, uh, fast data analytics which is basically uh, kind of typical of uh, data science uh, projects so using r and python and uh, so it's all the machine learning world okay so that's a little bit about me and uh, i've worked for a lot of uh, the fortune 500 companies uh, so both out of india as well as uh, us so my experience is uh, kind of divided between india and us so recently i moved back to india <coughs> so i worked in a variety of domains uh, so we we going to talk about uh, spark today and see where it f- fits into the overall uh, scheme of things in the context of uh, big data okay and please uh, feel free to kind of uh, key in your questions so i'll be more than happy to answer them okay so what what is big data actually so we uh, i'm i'm sure like a couple of you already uh, are working in this area so that, that, that's a no brainer but generally i i i want to keep this session interactive so from uh, we we have close to uh, participants uh, numbering 50 plus as, as of now i see it so i i would l- like to know from the larger audience wh- wh- what is their uh, notion of big data and uh, why why this is such a big deal so l- let's get started with that uh, discussion and then uh, we will build on it 
so and then there are no right or wrong answers so uh, uh, i i would say please do not hesitate and uh, 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 let the ideas flow <laughs> okay so there you go <laughs> so we have answers pouring, pouring in and uh, really uh, do appreciate uh, somebody um, is starting this. So thanks, Mohan. So Mohan is talking about three Vs. <coughs> Excuse me. So we will talk about what are these Vs. So that would start. Then somebody is saying it's about structured and unstructured data. Yeah. Uh, so th that's also right. What else, guys? And see, uh, so we're going to talk about V's, and in my presentation also, you'll see uh, we'll talk about the four V's of uh, big data. But uh, these V's uh, have been uh, kind of uh, expanding over the years. So initially, <coughs> when we started with this uh, this term being coined, uh, big data, so you had uh, certain characteristics of big data. Okay, so let's uh, see what those are and uh, we'll build on that okay so here uh, as you can see um, on this uh, screen we are talking about uh, the big data characters or what uh, what are the qualities your data should have to be classified as big data okay so here we are talking about volume as we all understand uh, volume is uh, uh, has to be large and again uh, the, the definition keeps on uh, changing so uh, I would say uh, the, the, by some estimates uh, see each day uh, all over the globe we are producing around uh, 2.5 quintillion bytes of data that is 2.3 trillion gigabytes which is a big deal now and actually today itself i was looking at some um, article which said uh, the data that has been generated in the last two years uh, is more than uh, all of it uh, combined in all of our history human history so uh, there is huge amount of data proliferation and uh, why that is important uh, this uh, to set this context <coughs> Uh, so we will uh, surely talk about it and uh, where does art come into the picture and how it is kind of a paradigm shift as far as uh, data processing is concerned okay <clears throat> so Bhardwaj also had a point he says uh, unstructured and structured data which is big in aspect of size through collection of data which could be useful for business purposes so very well said so that's the volume of data we've been talking about and Hashta says I see as a problem that every industry is facing as they are not able to do, deal with three Vs. So very good. So Harsha, I like your uh, phrase. So I also use that. So typically big data is a problem statement. That's how I see it. And we, we ought to have solutions to do, deal with this uh, problem that we all have, right? Uh, so the enterprises around us, they, they've been struggling over the last decade or even more than that to <clears throat> deal with this kind of big data. So let's uh, look at the other Vs. Uh, so volume, we are very clear, right? Second is the velocity, OK? So underlying the volume numbers is an even larger trend, which is that 90% of uh, the data, as I said, that's been uh, created in just the last two years. And the speed at which uh, data is being generated, accumulated, and analyzed, it's, it's on a huge steep uh, uh, acceleration curve, OK? And then uh, as of uh, 2016, by the end of it, uh, this year, there will be around 19 billion network connections globally feeding this velocity okay so there is uh, an increasing need for real time processing of uh, these uh, enormous volumes of data that we have okay 
so typically you have 200 emails going around every minute 300,000 tweets hundreds of YouTube videos that are kind of being uploaded right so uh, th this is the kind of uh, the scale we are talking about or the speed at which uh, data is being generated then uh, some of you already said about structured unstructured and all so we uh, have uh, another challenge in big data processing that goes beyond the massive volumes and incre increasing velocities of but that's also in terms of uh, manipulating the enormous variety of uh, these data okay so you have uh, most of the enterprise data which is in structured format so the uh, typical way we are used to it like in uh, in the form of tables okay then uh, because of the <clears throat> log data which became uh, very very um, which came to the fore because of e-commerce and a lot of uh, clickstream analysis and um, the amazons of the world and the ebay's a couple of decades ago so now you have uh, a lot of unstructured data and unstructured data is uh, well positioned to surpass even structured data by the end of this decade right <clears throat> so arun says uh, hadoop is a solution yeah hadoop is a good solution or uh, has been a solution which has been uh, kind of widely adopted so and Aritra Mahanto says, uh, can I please describe a little bit about veracity? Sure, uh, Aritra, we will talk about it. So I'm, I'm getting there, OK? So uh, let's uh, talk about veracity. So I, I'm sure we are all uh, clear on the f first three Vs. Uh, but I'm going to talk about seven Vs, actually. Uh, so what you see here is four Vs, but uh, we, we talk about, we'll talk about three more Vs. So the fourth V is the veracity of data, right? So the, uh, take it this way. See, understanding what big data is telling you is one thing. However, it is useless if the data being analyzed is inaccurate or incomplete. So this is all about data quality, data governance, OK? So you, you could have a situation which could arise when data streams they originate from diverse sources and uh, they pr present a variety of formats okay with uh, uh, these being emanated from these uh, different sources and by the time they kind of uh, arrive at a, a big data repository like hadoop or a data lake which you build using hadoop they may be rife with accumulated errors that, that are very difficult to sort out and see when uh, uh, we are talking about big data as a problem statement and we are looking at solutions or in terms of uh, monetizing or uh, generating value or actionable insights out of this uh, big data element if your data itself is uh, inaccurate then uh, you know, however good tools or uh, techniques you may use that is not going to uh, kind of take you or give you the edge right in fact it's going to go the other way so obviously these solutions they, these are a double-edged sword so you need to be very careful and that's where data veracity has gained a lot of importance see until a couple of years ago a lot of people or enterprises uh, they were very keen to uh, try out let's say hadoop or uh, see what these big data solutions are and then uh, they had a few use cases which they kind of shortlisted and then uh, they started working on it but the, it was not really uh, kind of productionized right uh, to a large extent but now in the last couple of years a lot of uh, big enterprises and small even um, small and nimble enterprises they have gone live with uh, the, their big data solutions and now they they face this challenge of uh, data correctness or uh, data veracity so it's it's a very important uh, component as well so Tawhid is asking how did industry unstructured data before Hadoop so uh, see unstructured data within the enterprises was hardly there right and uh, there were uh, file systems and uh, there were various mechanisms so what uh, this 
um, came into uh, to, came to the fore only when uh, actually at the same time when you had these big data infrastructures uh, were rolled out sometime in 2005-06. So unstructured data has been there for decades. You're right, but again, it was not on a massive scale. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay. So uh, as I said, I'm going to talk about a, a few more V's. Okay, the fifth V of uh, big data or the fifth characteristic of uh, big data is uh, variability. Okay. So see, uh, again, uh, your your data is uh, basically, uh, and th this is uh, in the context of, uh, for, for example, uh, let, let me put it this way. So the intrinsic meanings and interpretations of uh, this uh, conglomerations of raw data depends on its context. And this is especially true with natural language processing. Okay. So, for example, a single word may have multiple meanings that we are all aware of, especially knowing English, right? So new meanings are created and old meanings discarded over time. So you have to interpret these connotations, okay? And again, uh, this is uh, kind of very, very essential to engaging and responsive, uh, responding to social media buzz. So the boundless variability of the big data therefore presents a unique uh, decoding challenge if one is to advantage of its full value so your data itself is kind of variable that, that's what uh, uh, th this is a recent uh, I would say addition uh, not many people talk about it okay but uh, then there are a couple of more V's I would like to touch upon okay uh, and those are uh, really really important so uh, the sixth one I'm going to talk about is visualization. So for those who are from the BI background or traditional data warehouse uh, application background, they would definitely um, appreciate visualization being so important, right? But again, I would say a uh, core task for any big data processing system is to transform the immense scale of it uh, into something uh, that can be easily comprehended and actionable, right? So visualization is becoming very, very important. So even uh, Spark uh, introduced uh, dashboards and all a uh, couple of weeks ago. OK, so that's the sixth V. Uh, you definitely it, it kind of um, uh, helps in uh, representing the big data that you have. Uh, uh, if you have some kind of visualization tools, so you have the Elk stack like Elasticsearch, uh, Logstash, Kibana. Uh, if you some some of you guys have uh, had a chance to work on it, that's a really beautiful visual, visualization, and that's all big data visualization. So the seventh fee, which is uh, last but not the least, in fact, uh, th this is the driving force behind any big data solution. It's the value, okay? So obviously, no one doubts the. Uh, value that big data offers, right? And that's why everybody in this is in this game. Right. So obviously it delivers or it offers an enormous source of value to those who can uh, deal with it scale, unlock the uh, knowledge within. Right. So it's all about the value creation. So if you can uh, channelize your big data and kind of uh, generate value out of it, that, that will give you the edge. That, that will put you ahead of your competition. So this is the uh, seventh fee. <clears throat> so Bardwaj is saying a very good point. Bardwaj, uh, visualization will represent analytics too. See, uh, um, that that's very correct actually. Um, so visualization or um, or rather analytics is, is the end objective, right? When you want to have uh, your big data solution in place, when you are kind of uh, trying to get actionable insights it's all analytics and uh, and you know visualization is one of the best ways uh, you, you can uh, kind of uh, look at your data from different perspectives all right so so far so good right so um, i do appreciate uh, you guys uh, uh, kind of interacting and uh, sending your questions and 
<clears throat> and uh, then that really helps okay so let's move on uh, and see what we have next all right so we're going to talk about uh, so some of you uh, i have already uh, indicated that uh, you have uh, background in big data and uh, so obviously the assumption is uh, whenever we talk about spark we generally uh, compare it with hadoop so let let me uh, even before uh, talking about this uh, talk about uh, uh, <clears throat> map reduce in general or the type of workloads okay and then uh, we'll look at the limitations or where does uh, spark come into uh, play so uh, map reduce paradigm i would say it has uh, kind of uh, helped in this uh, big data evolution uh, in a in a in a big way right so map produce uh, is a kind of a programming model which was introduced like paper by jeffrey deem and uh, dean and uh, sanjay gemawad from google way back in 2003 and 4 that white paper was called uh, map produce and uh, simplified data process on large clusters okay so this paper described a programming model and an implementation for processing and generating large data sets see um, so here is an interesting tidbit okay let me talk about Hadoop and spark uh, with, with this uh, backdrop okay so Hadoop uh, kind of uh, evolved to address a particular need which was uh, big data storage and uh, processing of the batch workloads so see until a decade ago most of the workload was in the form of batch so your payroll still is a batch application right it gets generated at the end of the month or every couple of weeks or depending on your cycle right so you, you there is a cut off uh, time and then uh, it gets scheduled and it's uh, the job runs so that that's your typical uh, batch cycle and that's why how applications were uh, designed until uh, not too long ago so hadoop uh, when uh, it was being built by duck cutting and mike gaffarella at uh, yahoo they got the clue from uh, this paper i talked about this white paper which came out from uh, the google folks uh, so th that was primarily to address uh, the storage needs for big data at a very uh, reasonable uh, cost okay and uh, what uh, <clears throat> solution we got was uh, basically in 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 terms of uh, hdfs and a few other uh, components that formed part of the original uh, hadoop ecosystem so if you go back in time around 2000 uh, late 2005 and uh, 2006 when uh, uh, yahoo folks were building uh, hadoop they had only four or five components one of them being hdfs and uh, and and couple of others and now if you look at the hadoop ecosystem uh, it is close to i would say around 80 plus uh, components okay and why i'm talking about this uh, th this is really important to get the context where spark Spark originated, or rather, how it originated and why it originated. Because you already had a big data processing and storage platform. Why did you need another one? Right? That 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 that's a logical question which comes to everybody's mind. So let's try to address that. Okay. So when uh, the Hadoop started, uh, it was serving two purposes. So as a storage uh, infrastructure, so you could have anything which will go into hdfs and then the second part was the processing which was typically addressing the batch workloads okay and now what happened with hadoop was as enterprises started to adopt hadoop or embrace hadoop like uh, so for example uh, facebook started uh, using hadoop in 2008 they were they productionized uh, uh, hadoop so then they realized they had a lot of code which was using SQL like 
queries and all so then they kind of came up with an api which we call uh, hive as we all know it so hive was developed at uh, facebook and then open sourced to so given back to the community same way twitter had a particular use case so wherein they um, want to do trend analysis and everything in real time but there was nothing in hadoop which could enable that because hadoop was just addressing the batch workloads so they came out with uh, the storm api right and then uh, it was again given back to apache foundation and then uh, open sourced and uh, we all know so th th this is the way that hadoop has actually evolved and uh, kind of uh, uh, progressed or the, that's how its adoption and uh, whole evolution has been right so and the point here is uh, so hadoop never was uh, built as a ground up uh, solution to address all your uh, diverse and future needs or taking those into accounts it was a bare bone kind of an uh, system which kept on getting uh, enhanced so somebody um, did hive somebody did storm somebody did hbase somebody did whatever so and that's how it kind of uh, has evolved and uh, until today it's it's evolving like that right so for example you had a company called revolution analytics which uh, was trying to put the r api on top of hadoop right using hadoop streaming so uh, things like that but the, <clears throat> the and then there was an interesting initiative which was started by the federal government in us uh, when barack obama became president in 2009 the first thing one of the first things his administration did was uh, to kind of um, uh, have some funding reserved for um, developing a data science platform or a true blue big data analytics and data science platform okay so various academia they were pulled in and then there were proposals and then everything was kind of evaluated so the guys at the folks at uh, berkeley university of berkeley in california they were also kind of uh, very very interested so couple of guys uh, matai zaharia who is the creator of spark and ion stoika these two guys they were <clears throat> they, they were uh, kind of uh, looking at map reduce very very closely and uh, they they found like uh, a lot of limitations actually and then uh, they they proposed and they started uh, working on a uh, on a stack which was to address that uh, federal government uh, funding proposal so initially it was known as the bdas big data analytics stack it was not known as spark okay so it was just those uh, few research fellows and then uh, the group of students who started with the project actually and then uh, so the evaluation happened and then finally uh, university of berkeley's uh, project was kind of uh, the one which received the funding and then at very fast clip they kind of uh, evolved and uh, developed this uh, stack into a a unified kind of a platform which we know as spark and uh, so the actual uh, shape started coming in in 2009 uh, end itself so from 2010 uh, it was kind of open sourced and uh, and uh, rest as we know is history so spark is the most uh, followed project or is the, is the project which has uh, and the most number of committers actually ever so and uh, now if we talk about spark everybody is kind of uh, joined the spark bandwagon okay because uh, it's a very compelling uh, platform for data engineering data science okay and uh, there hasn't been anything like this before so interesting times so in 2015 
15 if you guys had been following the news or uh, kind of looking around there was a very big event uh, and i know there there are a couple of guys from ibm right so i'm sure they would be knowing so ibm uh, started their uh, spark technology center in uh, downtown san francisco last year in june and uh, there was this webcast which was uh, there uh, globally and uh, the ceo of ibm and everybody was there and uh, they kind of uh, made a big commitment uh, towards uh, evolving spark and uh, spark central theme to their big data computation engine whatever product lines they will build or that they have so spark is the central theme and ibm itself uh, has a very lofty target of creating 1 million data scientists on the spark platform in a few years okay so, uh, and why I'm highlighting this because, uh, see, IBM has, uh, as we all know, uh, big insights and uh, platform. So Hadoop is all good, but it is only restricted to storage. Obviously, there is a lot of code based on using MapReduce and all. But uh, now uh, things are changing at a very fast clip. In fact, the adoption of uh, Spark has uh, superseded that of Hadoop. So I think uh, initially somebody asked uh, the, the demo uh, whether I'm going to use Cloud Era or not. So see, Spark doesn't depend on Hadoop at all. Uh, you can use a Hadoop distribution, but uh, it's entirely up to you. Okay. okay. So Bhardwaj is saying, how do you uh, think demand of data scientists is there? Oh, there is a tremendous uh, demand, uh, Bhardwaj. Let me tell you. Okay. So I've been uh, working very closely in the industry, and I have a um, uh, lot of connects as well. So um, even uh, I would say a lot of the domestic uh, uh, niche players, smaller players, uh, they are hiring. Everybody is hiring. Uh, for example, if you go to uh, like Ola Caps or Housing.com or uh, bharatmatrimony.com. They are they're all looking for uh, data scientists, Flipkart and Snapdeal. And th this is just the, these are the marquee startup names, right? But even if you scratch the surface, the traditional enterprises, and, and so everybody is kind of hiring. Because, uh, so it's a very good question. And I'm sure uh, you guys uh, would be interested to know a little bit more. So let me put it this way. So until now, we are all familiar with uh, SQL, right? So um, if we want to query our data, how do it is? Basically run a query, SQL query, select star, whatever, right? So as they say now, the thing is really turned on its head. So ML is the new SQL, okay? So in a couple of years, if you don't know ML, uh, you will be really challenged to deal with uh, your data. And when I say ML, it's machine learning. And uh, machine learning is nothing but your data science. So hopefully that answers your question, uh, Bhardwaj, and for everybody's uh, benefit also, and uh, this uh, drives home the point. Right, guys? Yeah, you're welcome, Bhardwaj. Okay, so this was uh, some backdrop about uh, uh, how Spark uh, kind of evolved or what was the need of it, okay? <clears throat> so let, let's, let's talk about uh, MapReduce, all right? <clears throat> so what MapReduce does and then uh, how does uh, Spark basically uh, is a better way of doing things or how does it help? Okay, and uh, why? And uh, what's the reason uh, why Spark uh, is getting so popular? So, if you read the recent surveys which were uh, done by Databricks, Databricks is the company behind Spark. Okay, so they have a cloud-based offering uh, which has nothing to do with Hadoop. Okay, so until now, a lot of people associate okay, Spark will run with Hadoop on Yarn and all. That's fine, but uh, it doesn't need actually. So on AWS, you can use the Databricks cloud, you can use the IBM cloud. Spark has its own cluster and uh, it's good to go. 
So <clears throat> let's uh, talk about uh, uh, a little bit about MapReduce, how it does uh, the processing or how it works, and then how this get better in the Spark world. Okay, so there are a couple of more comments or questions that I see. So I'm sure I'll, um, like, I, I can address them right away. Okay. So Kapil is saying, after doing the course, would any company hire the candidate who has uh, done this course? See, uh, Kapil, there are no... Uh, so the, the, this is nothing... Uh, the, this is something, uh, again, dependent on a lot of factors. But what this course will do will set you up, okay? On the right track. You, you will have the right kind of uh, inputs. You will have the right kind of... Uh, 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 I would say understanding of where the industry is headed. What are the things uh, that you need to do? What skills you need to pick up? And again, I'm sure uh, there is a lot of uh, demand out there as I spelled out. So, and again, everybody understands this is a new area, new field. So this is nothing that uh, people will have a lot of experience. And this will have uh, in this area, not many people will have uh, lot of experience like uh, even two years is a big deal so data science is uh, relatively new okay so definitely this this will give you the edge the, this is the differentiator i'm sure so if you learn the skills yes you're ahead in the game so yogesh is asking how hadoop or spark is different from data science or analytics See, hadoop is basically your big data infrastructure it gives you the ability to store the data and uh, do computation. Spark is a compute-only engine. It doesn't. It's a storage agnostic. Okay, so uh, Spark doesn't uh, provide you with a storage mechanism. So it's, uh, Spark doesn't bother like if your storage is underlying HDFS. If you are using Hadoop or it is uh, Cassandra or MongoDB or your relational database, so it has connectors for uh, all of these different sources of data. Okay. And data science is nothing but uh, application of your analytics, high-end analytics. So you run machine learning algorithms using variety of tools like R and SAS and uh, Python. And uh, a lot of these APIs have support on uh, top of Spark. So that's why it's a very compelling platform. So you can do your data science stuff uh, using MLLib. You can use Spark R. You can use PySpark. OK? So Kapil is uh, added to what he earlier uh, commented. So yes, absolutely. So you, you'll see definitely a lot of value, Kapil. And I can vouch for it. I, I've been uh, doing this for a couple of years. And, uh, and a lot of the participants whom uh, kind of I have uh, provided training and uh, mentoring, that they are working uh, globally all over. So, um, mostly in the US and India. And I'm in constant touch, so definitely uh, you will gain a lot of value out of it. And see, the way uh, we do this is, is purely hands on. Okay, so there is very little of theory, whatever is uh, the bare minimum which is needed to cover the concepts. And uh, we make you do the stuff yourselves. Okay, that, that, that's the. A differentiate is that I come and here also you would have noticed uh, it's um, I, I don't talk about the PPT right here also you have seen whatever slides we have uh, ran through we talked about the uh, PPT had four V's I talked about seven V's so the, 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 that's the extra you will always get on this side all right and industry uh, level insights and, and the practical use cases. <clears throat> so Arun is saying, uh, what is the base program? Okay, I think he's out. I'm talking about the language. Okay, so Spark is written in Scala, and uh, you can use Scala, Spark, uh, Scala, uh, Python, R, or uh, Java. Okay. 
So typically we do using Scala because uh, brevity of code is there in Scala and it's very easy to pick up. And it has <clears throat> it has a mixed paradigm. Like uh, you can do your object oriented and functional programming. And functional programming is the way to go uh, on big data platforms. But again, uh, there could be scenarios where you could use Sparker, you could use PySpark. Again, depends on your comfort level or uh, uh, again, depends on the application as well. Okay. So Yogesh is saying how the course from, I, I think I've already addressed that. So here uh, the emphasis is on uh, completely on hands-on learning. And again, uh, we talk about a lot of uh, use cases and uh, practical scenarios. So as if you're really working on projects while doing the training itself. So that's what I would say is the differentiator at Academy. <clears throat> So Vivek is uh, saying, uh, please provide me the areas and research topics and how this course will help me in PhD thesis. So surely Vivek, we can talk about those aspects as well. So you have uh, a lot of interesting areas, I would say. <clears throat> if we talk about data science and uh, let's say if we talk about regression, right? It's a big, big area. And how basically uh, you do your regression, how do you kind of apply those methods, and especially with uh, deep learning coming to the fore, those are really interesting topics. So surely, um, uh, like let's say if you come on board, we can surely talk about those in detail and uh, will uh, definitely enable those th uh, things for you. All right. Uh, so Arsha is saying, can we expect some kind of help in getting a job in Spark? So yeah, that's uh, always there, yeah. So our team uh, works with you very closely to do that. Now, so the, this is more of a demo. Since people are asking, they, they are asking questions. Someone is saying, is this more of a uh, sales? And so no, I'm, I'm a purely technical guy. So let's uh, yeah, get back to this, OK? Just that uh, some of you were asking, so. So le let's quickly talk about uh, MapReduce, okay? So what we have with uh, MapReduce is uh, this uh, kind of a programming paradigm breaks processing into two basic phases, all right? So <clears throat> you have a map phase and a reduce phase, okay? So I'll, I'll here not go into the details uh, because uh, we have limited time, but uh, I'll give you a good overview or good sense of how things happen. And again, the output and input of each phase, they are key value pairs, okay? So the processes executing the map phase, they're called mappers. Mappers are Java uh, processes, JVMs, that normally start up on uh, nodes that also contain the data. Uh, <clears throat> contain the data that will process. So data locality is an important principle of map reduce. Okay. Which data sets moving the processing to servers that contain data much more efficient than moving the cross net. That's where uh, the first point comes to the first map is a uh, lot of back and forth movement that right to disk you read from there's a lot of IO actually which is involved. Okay, and uh, other thing is it is uh, mostly single pass computation. So there is nothing uh, iterative, uh, which is kind of enabled by uh, MapReduce. Okay, <clears throat> so an example of the types of processing uh, typically performed in uh, um, mappers, they are uh, parsing, transformation, or filtering okay so the when the mapper has processed input data it will output a key value pair to the next phase which is the sort and shuffle phase okay in sort and shuffle phase data is sorted and partitioned okay so obviously I'm not going to go into that but again uh, so again uh, just to give you a perspective this is involving a lot of uh, this uh, IO actually all right. 
now if we uh, talk about uh, let me see what we have here okay so yeah as i said it's uh, all uh, single pass computations that we do it's a typical batch uh, workload that map reduce addresses and uh, it is not suitable for iterative computations. So iterative computations come to the fore, especially in the context of uh, machine learning. Okay. So Vivek is saying uh, about his PhD. So uh, Vivek, I'll uh, come back to you shortly. Okay. So just please remind me, like, and we can surely talk about this. So this uh, seems very interesting. But uh, it, since it's uh, something specific to your interest area, I, I'll address it. Uh, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so the underlying thing we're talking about here is uh, uh, map reduce is basically disk intensive. Okay. And uh, other issue with map produces uh, it's just uh, Java so unless and until you proficient in Java it is uh, kind of uh, difficult to handle. and uh, performance wise uh, it is uh, awfully so by the way like map reduce is almost kind of uh, at the fag end of its uh, life cycle it's kind of dead and, no, um, uh, not many enterprises use MapReduce. If you talk about MapReduce, they think, okay, this is uh, something that is kind of uh, past. Okay. So I talked about uh, Matai Zaharia and his uh, team at UC Berkeley's AMP Lab, right? So in 2009, they researched possible improvements to the MapReduce framework. So their conclusion was that while the MapReduce model is useful for uh, large-scale data, uh, data processing in batch, MapReduce framework itself is very limited to a very rigid data flow model, okay? And which is not suitable for many types of applications, okay? So for example, applications such as iterative machine learning or interactive data analysis, they can benefit from reusing a data set uh, which is uh, kind of persisted in memory or cached in memory for multiple processing tasks okay so map reduce forces writing data to disk at the end of each job execution and re reading it again from disk for the next so when you combine this with the fact that jobs are limited to a single map step basically the single pass that we talked about and then a single reduce step you can see how the model can be significantly improved by a more flexible framework and that's what uh, Spark does actually. Okay, so out of this research came Spark, which is a new processing framework for big data that addresses uh, all of these shortcomings in the MapReduce model. Okay, so <clears throat> let's uh, talk about uh, how it happens in the Spark world. Okay, let me show you some pictures here. Yeah. <clears throat> this will um, get very, very clear. All right. So the, 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 this picture is de depicting a DAG model. Okay. This is directed a cyclic uh, graph model. All right. So <clears throat> these are uh, what you see here on my screen are directed as cyclic graphs. So looking back at, at uh, MapReduce, which we just talked about, uh, you had uh, only two processing phases, right? Map and or reduce. Sometimes it's just map. There's no reduce. But uh, <clears throat> within the MapReduce framework, it is only possible to build complete application by stringing together a set of map and reduce tasks. So these uh, chains of uh, complex chain of tasks they are known as directed acyclic graphs or DAX as you see in this uh, picture okay so DAX contain series of actions connected to each other in a workflow so what happens in case of map reduce the DAG is a series of map and reduce tasks used to implement the application okay the use of uh, DAGs to define uh, Hadoop applications um, 
again is not very new right so and then they are used in uh, all the high level abstractions that use uh, map reduce so you have uzi which uh, also uses uh, something like this right <clears throat> Uzi even allows users to define the workflows of the MapReduce task in XML and use an orchestration framework to monitor their execution. So what happens here is uh, in the Spark world, um, where it is different is uh, that Spark uh, basically uh, what Spark does is, uh, is adds, uh, or rather I would put it, let me put it this way. So what adds the fact that the engine itself created creates those complex chain of steps from the applications logic okay so in the map reduce model these DAGs are uh, kind of uh, added externally to the model but spark optimizes this okay and the spark engine the spark core itself creates these complex chains of uh, steps from the applications logic Okay, so this allows developers to express uh, complex algorithms and data processing pipelines within the same job and allows the framework to optimize the job as a whole, which leads to tremendous uh, performance improvement. Okay, so th th this is uh, how it uh, happens in the uh, spark world okay so let's talk about some of the components uh, this is uh, just a follow-up to what I said okay so we look at a demo where we see how we kind of uh, process uh, data in spark as opposed to Hadoop so before that is a good idea to get an overview of the spark component itself. okay <coughs> So Bhardwaj is saying when we are talking about map reduce that uh, implies Yarn as well, which is yeah, Yarn is just a cluster manager or a resource manager. The Yarn uh, you can use as a resource manager on Spark also when you are using Spark on a Hadoop distribution. Okay, but still uh, map reduce uh, uh, it, it it doesn't lead to any improvement in the map reduce uh, processing. Okay be it yarn or anything else so the flexibility with uh, spark is you can use yarn you can uh, spark can have its own cluster manager or you can use uh, mesos mesos is a large scale data center kind of uh, application uh, cluster manager okay so let's uh, try to understand the core components of uh, spark okay so these are uh, different parts of spark at a very high level Okay, so let's discuss the components uh, that we see in this diagram uh, from left to right. Okay, so you see the driver. Driver is nothing but the code that includes the main function and defines the RDDs. So shortly we'll talk about RDDs. Okay, RDDs are the heart or the core of uh, Spark. So uh, this driver is basically the code that includes the main and defines the RDDs and their transformations. Okay, RDDs are the main uh, data structures that we use in our Spark programs. Okay, I will talk about detail next. Okay, so you have your parallel operations uh, <clears throat> which happen in uh, or uh, which happen on the RDDs, they are uh, sent to the DAG scheduler. Okay. So this will optimize the code and arrive at an efficient DAG that represents the data processing steps in the application. And what you have is a resulting DAG, which is sent to the cluster manager. It could be Yarn, it could be Mesos, or it can be its own uh, Spark's own cluster manager. Okay. So the cluster manager has the information about the workers, assigned threads, and location of uh, data. Okay. So uh, this is how it actually uh, kind of uh, happens in the uh, Spark world. So uh, cluster manager has information about the workers, assigned threats, and location of data blocks, and is responsible for assigning specific uh, processing tasks to workers. Okay, and uh, cluster manager handles uh, is is a service that also handles the DAC playback in case of uh, worker failure. 
So I'm talking about fault tolerance. Uh, so in Hadoop, you had that uh, redundancy, you had that replication factor of three by default and so on, right? And as I said, the cluster manager can be Yarn, Mesos, or uh, Spark's own cluster manager. So th th these are basically the core components. So the, and why I'm highlighting here is that th this is what happens actually from an architecture perspective, how Spark is built. And so th th this is how we will uh, talk about a variety of things, going to the concepts level uh, very, very deeply. Uh, typically, if you look at uh, Spark architecture, Spark components, you would have seen that worker node and executor. Those are typical things that generally people talk about. So uh, this is just to kind of showcase that uh, we'll be uh, being a little deeper and uh, doing these extra things, which helps you to kind of uh, get the concept right and uh, right the first time. Okay. So let me know in case of uh, any questions on this. Uh, all right. So let me go back to the presentation that we have. So now, uh, and see, uh, so this is the same model we'll follow while uh, doing the classes as well. So we'll uh, see in the PPT, you can put only so much. It, it requires uh, much more to go beyond this, right? If I just read through this, explain you, this is fine. You'll get the hang of it. But again, the more involved concepts and the actual true blue things that uh, may not come to the surface, okay? So cluster manager acts as name node, which uh, contains no cluster manager is separate uh, Bhardwaj. Again, uh, the, the, this is a little bit outside of the scope of uh, I can talk about it. But again, the whole purpose is to kind of showcase you or talk about. So cluster manager is basically nothing but your uh, resource manager, right? In simple terms. And uh, that's a separate daemon. It's, it's separate from the name node. It's not name node. And again, uh, you are mixing it with Hadoop. So it doesn't have, Spark doesn't need Hadoop, as I said. So only when we are talking about Yarn, maybe Hadoop comes into play in case you are using Hadoop distribution. So it, it, it works uh, very differently. <clears throat> yeah. So let's uh, move ahead. Yeah, I'm going to talk about, um, yeah, thanks, Bhadwaj. Yeah, yeah, Shri Ram, I'm going to talk about RDDs a little bit. Okay. So uh, let's uh, quickly go through this. What is Spark? Spark is a fast and general purpose uh, cluster computing system that I've talked about. It's a um, uh, framework it's a computation framework it doesn't have any storage okay and again it it caters to variety of workloads uh, so you can do spark streaming you can do spark sql you can do mllib you can do uh, graph processing and ma many other things MapReduce just does batch so it's spark code does batch as well as uh, all these things so another different uh, difference is basically with Hadoop, you have seen you start your hive engine, you go to a command line, you start your uh, pig uh, shell and all that. So once you are in Spark, uh, you, you don't need to do different things to get into MLab or uh, anything. It's just one uh, kind of interface. Okay. That's the ease of use. And uh, Spark by next year will have support for uh, nine to 10 different languages. Okay. So recently there is a version which is in C++ also. You can do C or C++ in, on top of Spark. So you'll have Hax uh, Haskell, you'll have uh, Julia, you'll have uh, many other functional languages. So um, the whole idea is the world moves to Spark. And that's what uh, the companies behind Spark they want and uh, its adoption is also kind of thick and fast. Okay. So this, uh, for the ones who are kind of used to the Hadoop world, uh, this is uh, just some depiction of uh, uh, 
Spark and its ecosystem and how it's kind of uh, sits on top of Hadoop distribution. But as I said, it doesn't have to. Okay. And again, uh, there have been a lot of reasons uh, why um, <clears throat> in memory processing and uh, see, we talked about. So Spark saves on the IO cycles by providing a persistence layer or caching in memory. That's what I talked about earlier, right? So now you have uh, huge improvements in hardware. Memory is becoming dirty exponentially. So, and now the new systems that are coming up, uh, they are all uh, in memory. So you guys are familiar with HDFS, right? Now Cloudera itself has been working on a project called Kudu. I'm not sure whether you guys have heard about it. So just go and explore about it. So it, it, it's an in-memory uh, storage uh, layer. So you have Tachyon, which works with Spark. That's again in-memory. So everything is kind of getting there. SAP HANA, I'm sure you guys would have heard about, right? So the world is moving towards in-memory computation. And, and Spark is a prime example of that. OK? So this, uh, again, is a depiction of that in-memory caching. OK. So Sriram was asking, and Thomas will talk uh, about RDDs. OK. So RDDs are nothing but they stand for resilient uh, distributed data sets. OK. And uh, <clears throat> these are basically your uh, immutable collection of uh, objects which are partitioned. OK. So I know there are a lot of uh, words uh, that you see here. OK. So again, it's a concept uh, which is uh, kind of uh, unique to Spark, I would say. All right. So uh, all the underlying abstraction, uh, th this is the core abstraction that you have in uh, Spark, basically. So the way this works is uh, you have your Spark cluster and your data set is kind of partitioned across the cluster in very simple terms. Okay, So as you can see, it's distributed memory abstraction. And then uh, RDDs, uh, you can uh, kind of persist in memory. You, you, you can uh, persist on disk as well. OK? This is um, how it actually uh, works on top of Spark. So we'll see uh, how do we create uh, uh, these RDDs, and how do we work with uh, these uh, RDDs, OK? So typically, RDDs have uh, two types of um, uh, things going on. One is transformation, and one is action. So we'll have a look at both of these. And I know I, I don't want to kind of overwhelm you guys. So that's why I'm not uh, kind of taking a deep breath. Because uh, again, uh, that involves uh, lot of explanation and all. So all we need to understand is uh, your fault tolerance, which I talked about in the picture I showed, is uh, through these uh, lineage or uh, <clears throat> the lineage graph that uh, your uh, application builds. OK. So that's, again, um, because of the IDs. All right. So how do you create RDDs by um, so you have any kind of data structure like an array, like a list, or anything, and you parallelize it. There is this parallelize. SC is nothing but the Spark context, which comes by default. So I'll show you on the cluster, so then it will make a lot of sense. Okay. And the other thing is when you read from a data source, this is where RDD is created, and RDDs are immutable. Immutability is a key in functional programming. And in the big data world, it, it is really, really important. So once you have uh, some kind of an RDD, you cannot uh, change it. It's immutable. OK? So when you kind of work on it and create something else, the, that basically creates a new RDD. So these are the two ways you can uh, kind of work in an, uh, using RDDs. 
so we we have in fact uh, four or five sessions on rdds and if you are uh, doing this uh, let's say course uh, we prepare you for the data brick certification so that's all about uh, spark core and basic concepts uh, obviously at a very deep level so we'll take a deep dive so here if you see spark offers a unified platform so you have a lot of apis and more will come and so it's still evolving so you next is basically spark 2.0 as i said which is coming in the summer so th th that will also kind of uh, <clears throat> have a lot of uh, newer features okay So there are uh, obviously a lot of uh, use cases for uh, Spark, as you can see, um, in all these areas and more. And in fact, if you go to the IBM Tech Center, uh, Spark Tech Center, they are even uh, talking about like exploring life uh, uh, in outer space, aliens, a uh, lot of interesting stuff, and all using Spark. So it's not uh, plain vanilla stuff that is happening. Your typical applications on the go. It's all about taking humanity to the next level. That's where that's the to the extent. And this is not what I'm saying. This is the uh, big folks at IBM saying that. So you, you can read all of, all of that stuff. Uh, very interesting. Okay. So case studies there are uh, by the plenty and. And uh, again, uh, the, this is all uh, the so network uh, security or uh, you find out uh, about the intrusion, you do your clustering, genomic sequencing, real-time ad processing, how do you do your clickstream analysis, credit card. So a lot of use cases. So it's uh, wherever you have analytics, Spark is there. It has uh, kind of tools and mechanisms to kind of uh, help you with uh, these kind of uh, things so as i said our adoption of spark has uh, superseded that of hadoop actually in the last one and a half two years so 85 percent of u.s corporations have already kind of uh, set their sites on spark so 70 percent of them have already tried in some way or the other and next uh, another 15 percent are in the process so uh, th that's a big uh, kind of number I'm talking about. So now uh, we, we, we've uh, seen a fair bit of uh, stuff on uh, kind of getting to know what Spark is and uh, how it is kind of uh, driving industry, the big data industry. Let's uh, look at uh, one of the and demos that I have just to showcase you. Okay. And let me start with the Scala itself. So basically, I go to my Spark directory and then uh, start the Spark shell. So this will give me the Scala shell. And what we'll do is uh, we'll do a word count program. So while the shell uh, comes up, let me show you this. Okay. So I have a book which I've downloaded online. So that's kind of my text file. Okay. Let me show you that. It's in the books folder. So this is the uh, Gutenberg site. I'm sure some of you would have already made use of this. A lot of good free books, classics, which are available. So this is basically a text file. OK. So you can see uh, it's a book. And this is purely unstructured data. OK. So now what we have is uh, I'm going to 
uh, read this file and uh, do a word count. Basically, count all of the occurrences of the words, how many times the word is occurring in that uh, book. Okay. So what I do is uh, I, I'll get a Spark context when, as in when my Spark, as you can see, this is the latest version of Spark that we have. So Spark 1.6. Okay. So the Spark context uh, is your entry to the driver program. Okay. So what you do is uh, use something like val. Val and var are two keywords in Scala. Okay. So we typically make use of val because that is immutable. And then uh, you give some variable name. This is like a variable. And uh, you are reading the file, text file. This is the path of the file. Okay. I call it the book. What I showed you. Right. So all I'm doing is creating a variable. And this variable is nothing but your RDD. Okay. And then, uh, we work on this RDD. So if you guys are from the Hadoop world, you would know how cryptic uh, the word uh, word count program itself is. And uh, for uh, the benefit of everyone, this is the word count program that we have in uh, Java, in Hadoop, as you can see. So a lot of lines of code. And uh, what do you hear? Actually, two lines of code. So the, this is the difference between now you can see brevity of code and and uh, in terms of speed also it's it's pretty fast. Okay. All right. Let's uh, run this. I'm sure my yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Pakshal is uh, still uh, coming up. Let me uh, start the Python as well. So just before we go, we want to see, have a look at that as well. So I have a Python as well. Okay, let's, going back. So what you are doing is basically map and reduce. And this is just tokenizing using flat map. Okay. So I'm not going to go into the logic or semantics. Uh, so, but uh, this is how it is. And then, what I have is uh, this. This this is a new RDD which is created. WC, word count. Okay. And then I basically save the out this folder. That's all I'm doing. And we'll have the results here. So, <clears throat> as and when our Scala shell uh, comes up, uh, we will get started. This is the Pi Spark shell, uh, so I have started. So you can see both the things simultaneously. You'll just be taking a few more seconds, I'm sure. Let me see if any questions, because when I go to that window, uh, I don't get to see the questions because I'm using my virtual machine. So I think, uh, yeah, all of you are good. <clears throat> so uh, meanwhile, if uh, in the next minute or so, that surely will come up. I'll just look at uh, one of the things that Vivek had asked. So his PhD topic is uh, analyzing trends on <clears throat> So Mohan is uh, okay. Mohan is asking why 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 am I running both Spark and Scala? <clears throat> Excuse me. So just to kind of uh, demo you or show that uh, you can work either way. Okay. So this is your Pi Spark shell. So yeah, whichever you want to you can use. Okay. So let's run this code. Uh, so we sorry, I'll come back. Uh, this came up. Or let me run uh, one by one so that you can see. Anyway, it's not going to take much time. So this will create an RDD. That's the um, kind of uh, verbose message you will get. 
okay it created uh, rdd based partition and uh, define many partitions as well. then this is a single node i'm saying but you know thing start you know on uh, uh, definite uh, a lot of patients and it will make sense of uh, to do that parallelization so this is basically um, doing these transformations like flat map map and these are transformations and then uh, a new rdd will be generated oh it's already there i'm sorry my bad so it's it's pretty much actually the processing in uh, spark so if some of you who have used map reduce this is the action save as text file uh, basically generates an action okay so it, it takes only a few seconds to run this uh, read this complete book and uh, generate the output for you so if you do it using the map reduce way it, it takes a few humans actually so it's all done okay and uh, we can uh, go and check the output so I'll put this folder okay go there so it was successful and we can see all of the instances of our occurrences of all words that are there in this book okay so that was uh, i would say nice and easy right same thing uh, similar thing we can uh, actually do in uh, spark uh, in in uh, py spark as well okay so let me uh, do this as well i can go to my python shell and i'm going to read the read me file actually <laughs> Okay. Oh, I ran it on this. Uh, <laughs> sorry. I had to run it on the. I got it mixed up. I ran it on the uh, Scala shell. So this is the Pi part, Pi shell. Okay. So as you can see, you can do that, and then uh, you can basically. Uh, what I'm doing is uh, looking at this uh, line and trying to fill out the pairing and see yes, all these uh, So the of this. Uh, line that going to. Connection. This uh, filter was the transformation. So let me show you this. The readme file is this. Okay. So this is the first line which is uh, having Python as the word. So this is the line which is going to be printed here, as you can see. This one. Okay. This has the word. So this was just to kind of uh, show you. All right. So, so this is uh, what I had wanted to cover, and uh, <clears throat> see the, the code uh, syntax is a little different. It is specific to Scala, Scala, and Python. Uh, you can do the processing in whatever way you want to. Okay. So, uh, guys, uh, we'll be closing in the next. Uh, I would. Say uh, uh, a few minutes uh, as per our schedule time, but uh, definitely we want to know your feedback in the poll. So please, please uh, ensure that you do that and would really appreciate. Okay. And uh, back to <clears throat> okay, <laughs> Sam is asking. Uh, 
what is the best technology these is this what in job uh big data infrastructure that means uh, hadoop and spark so and obviously data science is your analytics so uh, all these are kind of uh, intersecting and so you cannot say okay i'll just do hadoop and be happy with it or just do spark and do nothing else or i'll just so obviously you cannot do you cannot aggregate like that okay Mahesh is saying, "What are the different ways of executing Spark command?" So, the, so Spark, uh, so shell gives you uh, ability to run uh, the. Otherwise, you can use this as an application and submit this job. Okay, that's the other way. So, coming back to Vivek's thing, which is saying, um, okay, uh, so he has some topics. Uh, so, Vivek uh, topics, yes, uh, with. Uh, in memory big data computing there are a lot of uh, uh, things happening so you have spark you have flink you have X, and uh, maybe you can come up with something and obviously the other part is related to your uh, analyzing tra trends on social media and search engine and predicting future threats and opportunities yes so that's kind of um, some kind of predictive modeling, which uh, obviously will uh, require a lot of thought. So yeah, so uh, we can surely uh, take all of these and uh, let's say you enroll in these classes and uh, data science machine learning, surely can uh, guide you and measure you or help you, okay? RDD is nothing but resilient data set, okay? So, and then one more uh, participant is asking if they have a testing background, so what should be the approach to join uh, data science or Hadoop uh, or Spark? So I, I would say uh, I will definitely recommend Spark along with data science, okay? And in the bar, obviously you will get a handle to Hadoop also. So you, can you call Spark commands from Java? No, right now it's not there. The There is no Java shell. So basically, uh, you have to use uh, uh, something like Eclipse or NetBeans, some ID, and then uh, you can submit your jobs, okay? Uh, Java doesn't have a shell. Java is a little behind on uh, this aspect. Yeah, so uh, uh, participants, I would uh, sincerely request you to kind of answer the poll, uh, okay? And so that uh, we have your feedback and uh, that helps us to improve and kind of uh, cater to your needs. Okay. So please do that. Uh, it takes uh, less than half a minute. Yeah. So Manish is saying, I mean, uh, can I add Spark commands in Java? Like, yeah, you, you can uh, do all these RDD transformations, actions. Yes, it, it will be Spark code, but you can write in Java using Java 8 or even Java 7. So Java 8 is more optimized. It's more like Scala, right? But you don't have a shell. You can do your programming in Java. There's nothing stopping you, okay? So Vivek is, uh, <clears throat> okay. So the uh, same participant is asking, who's from a testing background, where should they start? So you can start, uh, I, I would say, you can directly start with data science on First part it shouldn't be a problem okay and Vivek uh, I'm just taking the last couple of questions uh, yeah you're welcome Arun yeah my pleasure hosting you guys so uh, Harsha is asking will you teach Spark using Scala or Python so it will be predominantly Scala but now we can definitely uh, look at Python also yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. pleasure hosting you as I said so What's the prerequisite for the hardware? Hardware, I see when you're talking about standalone, uh, this thing, eight GB is min minimum, eight gigs, okay? And uh, like, uh, modeling can be done in, in any any area, like so numeric modeling, like regression, or even uh, your classification, yes, it's, it's an interesting and wide field out there. Yeah, so you, you can find the, 
course website itself so i would encourage you to go there or, or uh, we will uh, share it with you harsha okay so i think uh, uh, we've reached the uh, uh, end of the uh, session